Okay, we're going to get started. Um, it's great to see you all today. It's really wonderful to be out in Rochester. I, I, I was talking, I had Jane was so nice as to take me to dinner, and I got to meet her granddaughter, and I, Mary Lee jo joined us. It was wonderful. Um, great conversation, delicious food, what a treat. I used to get out here to Rochester quite a bit because I had work at Firebrick Gallery, and I was teaching there as well, and I haven't had reason to be out here since January. So it's like when I got the when 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 Pat contacted me and it's like would you would you be willing it was like oh yeah <laughs> definitely any excuse I haven't had an excuse so I was able to you know see some friends and take care of some other stuff and it's really great to be out here at Van Hoosen Farm it's such a great facility um, my name is Cheryl English I am an advanced master gardener out of Wayne County I am an, a master composter out of Macomb County. I have been gardening most of my life, and that's a long time. Um, and uh, I used to tend the area in the back left corner under the mock orange at my childhood home. Um, I now garden on the east side of Detroit in an area called East English Village, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. And I have a typical 40 by 120 urban lot. I'm near Cadu and Mac. Everyone in this room, whether they realize it or not, knows somebody who has a connection with this neighborhood. That has been my experience. Whether directly, it's, you know, that six, uh, what is it, six? Degrees. Six degrees of separation, I'm giving you three. <laughs> um, so I'm gardening on the east side of Detroit, typical 40 by 120 urban lot. I have about 50 types of clematis. In fact, I had an article on clematis in Michigan Gardener magazine earlier this year. And I also have over 200 species of native plants, ranging from ferns and grasses, spring ephemerals, other forbs, which is the term for herbaceous plants, uh, vines, both perennial and annual, trees and shrubs. I open my garden, I open my property, I should say, four times a year. I hold a pruning workshop, clematis pruning workshop, uh, the last Saturday of April. I hold two garden tours during the warm months, the first Saturday in June, the third Saturday in August. And then I have a holiday open house, usually the first or second Saturday in December. Uh, the garden tours are open to the public. From 10 until 2, you can just come in. Last year at our summer tour in August, we had 150 people. It was the best party I've ever been to, <laughs> and I threw it. It was so cool. But we do, we have, uh, I'm also an artist. I'm, I'm educated as an art historian and archaeologist, um, and I am self-employed as an educator, both garden and art educator. Um, I'm a writer, um, an artist, and a gardener. And uh, we usually have, I, I have my pottery for show and sale. Um, I also bring in at least one or two other artists. My friend Chris Hopp usually comes from Farmbrook Designs, and he will be teaching a hyper tufa planter workshop. And if you want to spend an hour or so with a really great teacher learning, having a lot of fun doing something where you're supposed to get dirty, this is the thing to do. So we're going to be having that workshop again. Um, and you get to see all the plants. The, the prickly pear cactus is always popular. Um, the season is galloping along. I have actually three garden tours. I have uh, the East English Village Garden Club garden tour coming up this Sunday, and then I have a private group coming in on the 3rd, and then my tour on the 17th. I open my garden to private groups as well. So if you're garden club, or women's club, or men's club, or card club, or Red Hat Club, or gosh, we haven't got anything better to do. Let's go make a trip to Detroit and see Cheryl's Garden Club. Um, I do that, and uh, I donate a portion of the, I do charge a fee for that, because it is time out of my day, uh, but I donate a portion of that to support the programs uh, that uh, involve with the Detroit Garden Center, especially their alternatives for girls. Um, so we're talking today about it is easy to be green. And this is becoming uh, a really hot topic the last few years. And I'm going to take this off. Uh, 
Um, and it's, there's, there's a, a lot of people have jumped on the green bandwagon. Have you noticed how true green Camelon is no longer true green Camelon? <laughs> They're just true green lawn care. Okay, now that doesn't mean they're not using chemicals anymore. It just doesn't, it means that it, what's happened is the chemical label is now a bad thing and people aren't going to use it. And be very careful about folks saying they're green because there's no regulation about this. So one of the best things you can do is start developing green practices in your life in your home and in your garden. And you, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do this. The whole idea is it is easy to be green, not just in terms of being environmentally sensitive, but, okay, let me tell you, as I said, self-employed artist, educator, gardener, blah, 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 okay? And I'm supporting four cats. <laughs> now, I have to, you know, they are the management team. We're down from six, so they are overworked, <laughs> egregiously overworked. But, okay, I have to watch every penny, all right? And I have boxes of 25-pound boxes of clay that I use. I needed to smother out an area in my garden. What did I use? I used those clay bo those boxes. I used the boxes. Broke down the boxes, the car corrugated cardboard boxes. So what I do with them usually is I take them over to the UPS store to Mike and Dave. And they give me a break when I ship stuff out because I give them all my excess packing materials that I don't use in my business that comes in for stuff I ship out. Some of these boxes got moldy. Can't imagine how that happened this summer. Um, and I'm not going to give them moldy boxes. I'm not going to throw them out. I am smother them in the garden. I shred my paper bags too. So we're going to talk about ways that are, you can both economize and be green, environmentally sensitive, in your daily business. If we can directly, indirectly reducing our use of water, water is a non-renewable resource, chemicals and energy, often non-renewable, we can improve not only the quality of our lives and our environment, but we can, we can conserve money. It's not just healthy, it's economical. Um, in my gardening business, after I was doing, pursuing this activity for a couple of years, I realized I had four informal policies. I use manual tools for all jobs. I don't own a weed whip. I don't own a leaf blower. I do own a lawnmower. It hasn't worked for a couple of years, so I borrow my neighbors every, like, three, year, three times a year. I'm not a turf person. I have a small amount of grass. It's one of the reasons I have garden tours. It forces me to mow my lawn. It's all in the back. The front is all garden. Um, the only thing that I would consider using a power tool for it would be something that required a, a chainsaw. There's nothing to get around. There are sometimes things that you can't get around using a chainsaw. If I can pay someone to do it, I will do that instead. But I, I know how to use a chainsaw properly. And I've learned that using a pruning saw for certain things really is not a long-term, you know, plan, <laughs> as my massage therapist can attest. I use native plants in a lot of my gardening. I actually wrote it, the first article on native plants to appear in Michigan Gardening Magazine last year. And we're going to have another uh, story on uh, native plants next year in that publication. I use organic sources for improving fertility and reducing pests. I don't use chemical fertilizers growth enhancers, or chemical pesticides, killer th things to kill things. Pesticides covers insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, all of those are pesticides. And I patronize local independently owned businesses as much as possible. Why? There's two reasons. One, and they're related, they are invested in your community. They want if they're, if they're going to continue to exist, they have to provide good service. Many, in many cases, they're family-owned. They've been here for generations. They know what works here. The big box stores 
Staff turns over faster than the bedding on my bed. Okay, don't run with that. <laughs> I don't conserve that much. Um, and these are not people who are invested in the community. They're not people who are invested in your success. It's not that they don't care about you. It's that they're not invested. If we don't patronize the local independent businesses, they will go away. Big box stores buy millions of individual plants, exactly the same type, distribute them across the country. In some instances, they don't pay the grower unless they sell. And they don't maintain the plants themselves. Merchandisers paid by the growers come in to maintain them. So if you really want, build, you can build relationships with these people. Get to know them. They'll get to know you and they'll say, oh, you know, Jane, she doesn't like that kind of soil. Don't give her that, no, -uh, she's not going to buy that. I go into Alamans and I get, there's a certain kind of potting mix I like. And there's a couple reasons for it. I came in there, they didn't have the big bag, they only had the one cubic foot bag. Joni told the young lady who was helping me, because she started telling me, well, we have this other one by this company, and she's like, she doesn't like that. She likes that one. We'll give you the two foot bag at the one foot bag, you know, we'll give you two one foot bags at the two foot, don't tell Rob I was going to do this, okay? <laughs> You're not gonna get that at a big box store. Oh, I didn't talk too much. Native plants, they evolved here. You know this crazy weather we have? It's killing, you know, not killing literally, but it's, it's, it's brutal on a, a lot of the exotic traditional garden plants. I was out in my garden working today, and my giant sunflower is actually completely living up to its name this year. It is about 12 feet tall. My cup plant languished last year in the drought we had. It was really bad last year. It was only nine and a half feet tall. It's 10 and a half feet this year, you know? These plants shake off a drought. They handle the soil conditions here. The hardest thing you can try to do in your garden is, to, is change your soil quality. It's, it's a long-term battle. Why, why fight it when you can work with it? And with native plants, that's what you're doing. Now it doesn't want to work. Okay, water. Water is a non-renewable resource. What does that mean? We can't make more of it. There is a fixed amount in the system. And actually, it may be slowly, very, very imperceptibly, slowly diminishing because stuff does leave our atmosphere, okay? There's a fixed amount, can't make more. Most of the globe's water is salt water. Can't drink that. It can be desalinated, but it's very expensive and requires a lot of energy. We can reduce our water use and recycle and reuse the water we use, and that way we can reduce the expense of water treatment. You know, it worked. One of the big things, especially in Michigan, because we are the Great Lakes state, we are surrounded by water only rain the drain. Our storm systems link directly to our lake system. Whatever we put in that storm drain system goes right into the water. Okay. Um, so keep out your oil, your pesticides, fertilizer residue, any dirty water. Keep leaves out because let even organic matter, even though it's organic, contributes to the, the chemical pollution in the water as it's decomposing. Um, Definitely no pet waste, grass clippings, and keep in mind that we use a tremendous amount of pesticides and fertilizers on this stuff, and it sucks it all up, and when you cut it, it's in there. That's why I don't, you know when I was a kid, I used to like chew on gra gra grass blades? I don't do that anymore. <laughs> mm -mm. Okay, white gold, S snow, that's white gold. Um, the battery died <laughs> on this, on this. Um, you know how you shovel most of the time, you shovel up and down your drive when you put half of it on your side and half on your neighbors? I don't do that. 
I like to share most things. I don't share tiramisu. <laughs> I don't share my snow. It all goes on my garden. People think I'm really strange, and I am, but that's not why. Um, as it melts, it's, it, it's a great, the wall, snow is a great stuff. When I was at, in upstate New York going to grad school, I realized that during the winter with the snow, because they have the same weather here, it's just hilly, even better, um, the sound didn't travel. It's a sound insulator. And with the neighbors I have, it's a wonderful thing, okay? So it's a great insulator, both for sound and for temperature. So it prevents desiccation. You put it on, the, you put it on your garden. It keeps plants from drying out. It keeps plants from freezing and thawing over and over again. You get frost heaving. It filters down through the soil into the water table. It cleanses the water of impurities. It recharges our aquifers and gets a jump start for your garden in the spring. All ready to go. Pre-watered. OK, there was this video on YouTube of a moose doe. That's the right term, because meese, mooses are, are, are deer, and female deer are does. And her two fawns playing with an oscillating, actually, she wasn't, but the kids were, with an oscillating sprinkler. And those, those two guys, I think moose calves, isn't it, maybe? That's where they break up. Um, they were loving that oscillating sprinkler. And that is what an oscillating sprinkler is good for. <laughs> they are good for running through in your bathing suit when you're seven. That is the only thing they're good for. They don't deliver where the water where it's needed. It, the water needs to be in the root zone. That's where the vast majority of water is absorbed by a plant, through the roots. Most of the water evaporates, making our already human summers more grueling. I'm asthmatic. Do you imagine how I was last week? You know, just lay me out on a cold slab somewhere. Um, water that lands on foliage can actually create a very productive environment for fungal disorders, which can, in some cases, be fatal. Water that lands on impermeable surfaces is completely wasted, because it goes back into the storm sewer system. I can't see, tell you how many people were watering, you know, the day after we had those storms on Friday, watering their lawns because they had sprinkler systems that didn't have, you know, that, you know, they don't have sensors and stuff. Or, you know, the, the, the oscillating sprinkler is going around and it's watering the street. I ride my bike through my neighborhood and it makes me nuts. Soaker hoses are pretty good things. They're made from recycled tires, so they help relieve uh, pressures on landfills and the risks of high CO2 generating tire fires. Um, they do promote better growth and healthier root systems while reducing weeds and splash-induced plant diseases. They deliver the water where you need it, in the root zone. They don't leave any water, on, any water residue on foliage, so you don't have to worry about those disease issues. You can conserve your water. I went from a $160 a month water bill to a $40 a month water bill with soaker hoses. Now, part of that is also that <clears throat> I don't water anything anymore. That's another great thing about native plants. Once they're established, I have certain things that I've planted. I have baby lupins that have sprouted up in my garden. They get watered three or four times a day from my rain barrel because I'm not losing any of those baby lupins. Um, they can be used in raised planters, median strips, foundation stabilization, hanging planters, etc. They can be left out year round. Do realize that if you, they are exposed to the air, like anything made of rubber, they will begin to stiffen and they may end up rupturing. Um, you can buy what you need to customize your own system with compression fittings and poly tubing. It's very flexible. It's a very flexible system. Um, because they're made from recycled uh, materials, and they're often made here in the USA, that's not a bad thing. Um, slow release, proximity to the hose to the soil, leaping water saves 30 to 70 percent water usage. It's a huge, huge change. A um, couple things. Set the hose material out in the sun on a hot day to work out the kinks, because those things are wound up really tight. Okay, so lay out on your, like your driveway so it'll, get, it'll soften up before you try to manipulate it. Don't use more than 100 feet of hose. Water pressure diminishes the further out, 
So the other thing to do is put the end of the hose where the plants, group your plants together so the water loving ones are together. This is just a good general rule. The drier ones in another section, put the end of the hose at the dry end and the, water, the ones that want more water at the wet end, okay? Um, I used, um, oh, don't, don't try to run it up a slope. Running down a slope might work, but running up a slope is not gonna work very well. <laughs> Unless you got some kind of pressure, okay? Um, I, the only thing that I found good about landscape fabric is the staples. <laughs> and I use those to staple down the hose. Or you can use the, like the um, stakes from black plastic edging, which is another thing I don't use, but the stakes are good. The stakes are really good, okay? And use a looping layout. When I, when I mean a, let's see if we can get anything out of this. It's dead. When I say a looping layout, let's say this is your bed. So you hit, okay, because it's about foot to 18 inches that you're gonna get effect from. Cover the hose with mulch, but not soil. Because you know what happens when you cover it with soil? You can't see it anymore, right? And then you put your shovel in to plant something, right? And what's the first thing you hit? For, it's like, <laughs> slice right through. Um, use push fit connectors. They're a lot easier on your hands than, this is really bad on your wrists. Twisting on things, twisting things off of your hose. Push fit connectors, much easier. Um, leave the access point hose for your, access point for your hose visible. Sometimes I like to get a fitting that's like a bright yellow or bright red so I can, oh there it is. So I'm not hunting around for it. Um, there are hose repair kits out there, you're going to get holes, things happen. Don't use the kind that have the metal clampy things, because then you'll have old faithful. Geysering. You want the, the clamp type that screws tight two pieces with two screws, with a, two of those, with a plastic tube that fits together, clamps it all together. That's the kind you want, don't use the, mm -mm. claw one's bad. Okay for conventional hose, bad, bad, bad for soaker hose. Think about using a professionally installed uh, sprinkler system. Timers, it's just like having a thermostat, a programmable thermostat on your house. You don't forget to turn it off, okay? No overwatering, and overwatering, that's the disease issue again, not just spending money, but the disease issue. I had my neighbor, she would water her lawn for two hours. It was great for my oak tree. <laughs> um, make sure you're using the appropriate heads for the correct delivery of water for the context. Lawn versus garden, okay? And you know, so like if you're at the corner of the lot, you don't want it going onto the sidewalk or the driveway, right? Um, include a sensor so your system is not running while it's raining. And I, they should be able to come up with something that says 24 hours after it rains, it doesn't turn on. That would be a cool thing. Maybe I should invent that. Then you'd never see me again. <laughs> Check the system regularly. One of the things I do as a professional gardener is I will walk the property and see, are there areas that look too dry? Are there areas that are wet? Are there sinkholes that indicate a head that's been damaged in some way? That's been blowing out the soil, okay? And I'll let my client know that. Drip irrigation systems can pinpoint specific plants for water delivery, further reducing water usage. Now, one thing to keep in mind, some native plants do not tolerate city water very well. My orchids do not get city water unless it's cured. They do not get, and I, what I mean by na orchids, my native orchids, my slipper orchids. I only give them either cured water, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about that, or water out of my rain barrel. And um, I've talked with my friend Trish, who's a native plant uh, propagator in Ortonville, especially with the new seedlings, rainwater. So my baby lupins, they're getting rainwater. I tell them, you're getting the best stuff, top of the line, and they're responding. Um, please don't use a water or a leaf blower to clean debris from your sidewalks or driveway into the street. 
it's very wasteful of non-renewable resources, whether it's water or energy, yes. Setting. It's just not a. It's just. It's just opens a whole ugly can of worms there, doesn't it? What are we sweeping here? You know, you know. You're, the other thing is you don't have that much control with it. It blows into the street, the sewer system. Leaf blowers are also one of the most pernicious sources of urban and suburban noise. I love it when they fire them up at 7 a.m. <laughs> just a great way to wake. Actually, I'm up by two hours by then. But I, you know, part of the reason I get up early is I like the quiet. Use a broom. Sweep, them, sweep it into the garden or dispose it in the trash as, as appropriate. You've got a lot more control. Pinpoint control. I have a control issue. It's really good exercise. So like, I, I can have those cookies now because I swept. You don't burn that much fuel. You know, Cheryl energy is renewable. And if I use enough of it, I, don't, I can get away and not have an orange for dessert. I might be able to have tiramisu. <laughs> okay? I'm not using any non-renewable petroleum-based energy, and there's no noise, except this quiet susurration of the broom. Sort of a meditative thing. Okay. Use a commercial car wash to wash your car. The water is recycled and reused. Right in there, built into the system. If you, if you want to wash your car at home for some reason, use a biodegradable soap and wash it on a permeable surface. I used to think my old neighbor across the street from me was crazy because he'd pull his Monte Carlo up on the front lawn and wash his car. He was on the cutting edge. <laughs> he was watering the lawn. Who knew? That was 10, 15 years ago. Um, OK, so you know, don't wash it on the, you know. I don't actually ever wash my car because it's pointless. <clears throat> Get a rain barrel. Roofs are impermeable surfaces, thank goodness, well, except for one part of mine. Um, one inch of rain can generate about 600 gallons of water on top of a 1,000 square foot roof. Now, when you measure the roof, you're not measuring the area here. You're measuring the area here because it's sloped, OK, remember? All right, just, that's the math. Um, cycling that water into a rain barrel allows you to redistribute it according to your needs in terms of areas in the garden and timing. I haven't had to use as much of my rain barrel water this year as I have did last year at all. But I have one. I want to get three more. So I want to have four altogether. Very important, level surface. These things are very heavy when they're full. Very heavy. I now know that if I can't shift it, it's pretty full. I'm pretty strong. I can throw a lot of weight against it, you know? OK, it's pretty full. Good, cool, all right. Um, Downspout. Once you position your rain barrel, you want to remove a section of your downspout to feed into it. What I did with mine is I have the downspout and then I have a rain chain, which is really pretty. It's a nice thing and it makes a nice chuckling noise as the water comes down. You're going to have an overflow so that if the thing gets too full, it has some place to go. We don't want geysering water spewing everywhere. Okay. Um, there's a community garden across Mac Avenue in Gross Point Park, um, and they have what they have is they have the overflow leading into the next rain barrel. They have six or eight rain barrels tied together. And everything just flows and flows and flows all the way into there. So we're talking um, 50 gallons, probably about 400 gallons of water. And it's all free. It's a gift from God. When you store it for the winter, empty or drain it because water expands, it can break your rain barrel. Remove the spigot, runoff hose, and drain plug before storing for the winter. When possible, st to store it, store it in a protected or indoor area. If you can't do that, make sure you store it upside down so no one takes up residence in the winter time. Okay? Um, there was something else I was going to say. Um, I can't remember. You don't want any unwelcome guests. This actually is not accurate anymore. I can't find him anymore, but there is one in Taylor, I think, that's uh, been active in the area, and I need to get that information in here, but uh, they are out there. And I know St. Clair Shores is having a rain barrel sale in the next few weeks. 
Rain gardens. How about a rain garden? Where the grade is lower, creating a place for water to collect. You're there's a place for, to plant water, plant, put in plant types that can absorb that water. Because um, I know I need to keep moving here. It's also a visual asset. I, I've heard, seen studies where, you know, turf grass versus rain barrel, with rain gardens, much more attractive, much, much lower maintenance, less, no chemical usage, you know, instead of this flat, endless turf, something really beautiful to look at, because some of these plants are just exquisite. Um, you know, how can you go wrong? Here's an example of a rain garden. This is the retention or recharge zone for the aquifer here. This is the detention or filtration zone. This is where the water percolates through down to that area. The pooling zone is where the water pools and then it will disperse down to the, the retention area, the slope leading into it. And you can plant a lot of, you know, river birch would be a great tree for a rain garden. Um, red osier or uh, red twig dogwood, it's a great shrub. Uh, also uh, spice bush, things like turtle head, cardinal flower. Um, some of the sedges are really great if you want grassy plants in there. Um, um, blue flag, uh, northern blue flag, southern blue flag, irises. There are a lot of great plants that will work really well and give you uh, three season to four season interest in a rain garden. Um, cinnamon fern, another one. This is the cornus stolonifer or red osier dogwood. Lobelia cardinalis, which is, as a bonus, very attractive to hummingbirds. Um, bee balm, which we have, that's fistulosa. This is didyma, or a cultivar of didyma. Thank you for bringing that in. A little visual aid there. Um, royal fern likes a lot of water, too. White turtle head. And you can start having uh, a, a, a zoo garden. Turtle head, cardinal flower, you know. All sorts of cool things. So here you go. Spiderwort work, will work well too. Get some purple in there. This is uh, I actually think that's black-eyed Susan. Yeah. There's a lot of great stuff you can plant without struggling with this feature on your landscape. So instead of having flooding, you're having a garden. Try using, try grading your impermeable surfaces toward your vegetated areas. That means that your driveway is sloped not towards your house like mine. <laughs> <coughs> we have Grayton Brook sometimes running through the basement. Um, it allows the water to percolate into the ground. It saves you water in that area. It's sort of like the, the, the warm season version of the snow thing. Try to reduce impermeable surfaces. Remember those two track driveways you used to have? Why do we stop having those? Hmm? Minimize that, that surface. Um, permeable pavers, gravel, these are all solutions. Now, when you do a permeable paver or gravel, that is the place where you use landscape fabric as a weed barrier. Landscape fabric was developed for agricultural usage. It was developed for seasonal usage, which means it's put down at the beginning of the season, it's pulled up at the end of the season. It was not intended for permanent ongoing use in, in a home landscape setting. It's not the worst thing you can use. It's the second worst thing you can use. The worst thing you can use is plastic. If you want dead soil, use plastic. If you want almost dead soil, use landscape fabric because it becomes a barrier for oxygen exchange, a barrier for nutrient exchange. You don't get any carbon, you don't get any nitrogen, any, any oxygen through there. The soil begins to die. And if your soil is dead, everything else is going to die too. Don't overwater turf unless you want to water my tree. During drought conditions, turf will actually just naturally go dormant. The worst thing you can do is give it a little bit of water, but not quite enough. That stresses it. Let it go to sleep. It's like me last Thursday night after those four days of heat, and I gave it up. Let me sleep. Once it once we get the cool rains coming in in September, it'll wake up again. But again, don't struggle with it. Better solution, don't have turf or reduce your turf. Turf is one of the most efficient types 
of landscape coverage. It's very energy demanding. We use mowers to mow it. We use petroleum-based pesticides and fertilizers to treat it. It is not a naturally occurring phenomenon anywhere. There's two things that contribute to our turf obsession. One, our presumed heritage of landed gentry in England who had thousands of acres and large herds of sheep that mowed and fertilized sustainably. They're using sheep on Boston Common now for this, okay? All right, so that was the first thing. The second thing was color television and the PGA tour. <laughs> oh my God, look at that green at Pebble Beach. I want that. And I'm willing to enslave myself to do it. You know, they have dozens of groundskeepers to maintain that. Um, not my thing. You know, mowing the lawn is like vacuuming. It's a repetitive, unpleasant task. Um, water valuable landscape plants. Trees and y young trees and shrubs are the greatest investment in plant matter in our gardens. They are the most expensive single items if you're going to buy plants. That's the most expensive item. They are the most expensive to replace them. So they are the ones that you should be focusing your attention on if we are having a drought and you have minimal water resources. Okay. For their first three years in a new site, young trees need 15 gallons of water a week. Shrubs need five gallons of water per week during the growing season for three years. Water them first, then your perennials, then your turf. Woody plants first. They add the most value to your landscape. Don't plant numerous exotics or natives that require significant supplemental water. If you don't have a fen, don't plant fen plants. If you don't have a bog or a wetland, don't plant those. Work with what you have. And I can give you a list of 200 in my yard, and then I can refer you to a bunch of other people who can give you a list of another 400 that might work as well. As I said, I don't supplemental water except for my orchids and my babies and transplants. Nothing else gets watered, because I'm not hauling that water. Um, there is no such thing as a temperamental plant. If you give a plant what it needs, soil quality, light exposure, nutrients, other conditions, it will thrive. If you do not provide those conditions, the plant can only work with what you give it. It can't get up and walk away like my cat and go, that's it, I'm done. Okay? They're, they'll struggle on as best they can. If they're not performing, it's not the plant. There's something wrong with the location, and that's your responsibility. Um, so why not plant things that you don't have to struggle with? My hairdresser, who I, I talk to once every five weeks on the phone, and then see her about three days after that, called me completely out of the cycle. Like, what are you calling me for? And she's like, I have this rhododendron. And I said, tell me about your rhododendron. It's like, well, I've had it for five years, and it looks worse every year. And it did flower this year. And I said, did it have like one flower? She's like, yeah. I'm like, it's time to let go. <laughs> it's time to detach with love. Why struggle? But it's alive. Yeah, well, how long are you going to make it suffer? Um, try planting xeric native species. Xeric means drought tolerant. Okay? They evolved here. They are adapted for our climate, and we have an extreme climate here. We can span 100 degrees. Anyone who was here last week knows this is true in a 12 month period. You don't get that in California. You don't get that in Florida. You don't get that in Maine. You don't get that in Washington State. But you get it here. Okay? And we almost every year, and I'm waiting for it this year, we almost every year, the mid end of July into August, get a drought. We might have a cold, dry winter. We might have a wet, cold winter. We might have a dry, warm. You know, who knows what winter's going to be? 
Even the farmer's almanac isn't always quite on, okay? The plants have evolved to accommodate these conditions. Again, why are you struggling? Gardening should be fun. It should be rewarding. It shouldn't be frustrating. Um, once they established, my, the work I do in my garden, I, every year is less weeding. Because the, the native plants are like, yeah. Even the bindweed is starting to give up. I notice that. There's areas that the bindweed's gone, forget it. Mm -mm, not even going to go there anymore. That's, you know, what can I say? Uh, there's a section on my neighbor's property that's right next to my driveway that many years ago, before they, they moved in about a year and a half ago, the prior resident allowed me to plant black eyed Susans, spiderwort, and coneflower. The first year I watered it with a soaker hose. I haven't watered it since then. Just sky water, that's all. The neighbor who lives there now is an antisocial person, being kind. <coughs> his, uh, he and his wife, and they have, I think, three kids, her mother. Their eldest son is a lovely person. He's very articulate. He's well-spoken. He's conversant. And um, the dad mowed that area twice this year. And I'm like, it's hard pan clay. It's hard. It was bad before. Then she had it waterproofed, and they backfilled with worse. Okay, those black-eyed Susans were a carpet of green. Not a bit of fungal disorder on those leaves. Yellow, vibrant, nothing. You know, and the, everything was beautiful. He mowed it twice. It might have been spite mowing. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, this weekend his son was out there doing the lawn. I said, oh, a teachable moment. And I went out, and there was one plant that was tucked up against the corner that they hadn't cut off that was beautiful. And I said, you know, Leonard, that whole area here used to look like that. He's like, yeah, I remember that. What happened? I'm like, your dad mowed it. <laughs> and you see now, there's all these weeds. There's Indian poke. There's all these tree seedlings. There's all these weeds, thistle and everything, that used to be smothered out by those plants. And we did nothing. It was zero maintenance. Lowest maintenance, highest production area in the yard. And he said, can they come back? And I said, if we leave them alone, they, will they won't come back completely this year. But if we leave them alone now, they will come back next year. He's like, OK, I'm going to take care of the lawn from now on. If I supplemental watered those black-eyed Susans, they would, get, they would start getting fungus on them, on the leaves, black spot. As I said before, plant your xeric species together. Plant your mesic plants together. Put your hydric plants together. Put your hydric plants closer to the water source so you don't have to walk as far. Think about that when you're planting your garden. Most of my hy more hydric plants are on the side of my walkway that gets less heat and intense sun. On the other side that gets more, that's where my cactus is. There is a native cactus. It's called the eastern prickly pear. And all my more xeric plants are on that side. So I make the landscape work for me. It's more shaded because in my garage, water evaporates more slowly. That's where my cardinal flower and my turtle head are. Um, you're going to save a lot of time when you're watering, you're going to save a lot of water in your, when you're watering, and you're going to not be dragging that hose over everybody. Turf grass, Indian grass, big blue stem, that is 10 feet. So how is this plant going to perform in a drought? really well. It's going to be really fine. How is this plant going to do in a drought? It's pretty simple, isn't it? And a lot of these um, fall grass, these uh, native grasses, the, I have little blue stem planted in with uh, fragrant sumac. Great fall color on a lot of these guys. Here's another one, turf grass. Here's your green ash tree. 
Most of the roots in trees are in the first 12, 6 to 12 inches of soil. But their roots, the root hairs, are three doors down. Okay? That's where they're absorbing the water. Fox sedge, is a, here's another zoo plant. Yeah, mm -hmm. Big blue stem, we saw that. Red osier dogwood, golden rods. Cup plant, the, the silphiums are down here with their root systems. Tall grass prairie plants go down 8 to 10 feet in the soil. And what we had here, short grass prairie west of the Mississippi, tall grass prairie east of the Mississippi. Now we had mostly woodland, but where we had prairie, it was tall grass prairie. Try using organic mulches. Pine bark, cedar, hardwood, do not use cypress. It is not sustainably harvested. Neither is peat moss, for that matter. Minimize evaporation, reduces watering. It controls weeds. And it also makes it easier to pull out the ones that do sprout. It reduces temperature variation, so it, provi it provides an insulating uh, barrier. So it prevents frost heaving of late season transplants during the winter. It also decomposes and breaks down into carbon that further nourishes your soil. Yes, it does need to be refreshed on a regular basis if you choose. You can also use things like leaf leaves, ground up leaves or not ground up leaves. I actually have people come to my door in the fall asking if I'd like to have my front yard raked. And if you've ever seen my front yard, the first thing that comes out of my, my mouth is, how are you going to do that? Because <laughs> there's no grass out there. Think about other ways you can conserve water. I used to have a fish tank. I would change the water out of the fish tank, use it to water my indoor plants, and then put it on my outdoor plants. During the winter, I would put it on my compost pile, because it would be too warm, it would burn anything, I would put it on in, out in the garden. Put a bucket in your shower while you wait for the water to warm up, and maybe even while you're showering, although I keep stumbling over it in that context, and I haven't been able to figure that one out. Think about other options for recycling your gray water, your laundry, you know, or your dishes. Sometimes I have two pans. I, if I have a lot of dishes, I'll have a wash pan and a, and a rinse pan. The rinse pan definitely always goes in the garden. It's actually gotten to the point where I, my cat, Donnie, is like, I like hot water. I like hot water to drink. So now the rinse pan has become the Donnie water dish. <laughs> so that doesn't get used for the rinse pan anymore because we don't want him any, having any soap. All right, chemicals. For the purposes of this presentation, chemicals are man-made additives designed to either enhance productivity, what we would call fertilizers, or designed to suppress undesirable insects, plants, and fungi, okay, for the purposes of this presentation. There are organic chemicals, organic chemicals, naturally occurring chemicals. All right, we're not talking about those. We're talking about man-made chemicals. They are frequently manufactured using a high degree of petrochemicals. Anyone remember the Green Revolution? There are people in this room who remember the Green Revolution, okay? That's when we discovered how we could make nitrogen, one of the three key nutrients for plant growth. Prior to, the, to that development, nitrogen could be fixed in the soil two ways, Ni lightning strikes. Now, if we could harness lightning, that would be amazing. Too unpredictable, too powerful. Um, and nitrogen fixing plants, including mem members of the legume family, the, the Fabaceae, things like um, lupins, baptisia, redbud, these are all in the pea family, okay? But they are not the only instances of nitrogen fixing plants. These are plants that have nodules on their roots. They are able to draw nitrogen out of the air and fix it in the soil with the no nodules on their roots. They're often used as cover crops on fallow fields to bring the nitrogen back into the soil so that they can be planted again the next year. All right, those were the two ways we could get nitrogen. Then we discovered if we used a lot of petroleum, we could actually make our own man-made nitrogen fertilizer. And we were going to change the world. The problem with fertilizers is in order to make them water soluble, we use a lot of nitrates and nitrites in them. These are salts. And if you continue to use these materials on your soil year after year after year, you actually salinate your soil. 
What happens if you salinate your soil too much? You can't grow anything. It's apocryphal, but one of the things that supposedly happened at the end of the Third Punic War, this is where we get into my educational background as a art historian and archaeologist and of pre-classical and classical history. Um, theoretically, uh, apocryphally, Rome sowed the fields of Carthage with salt. They were not going to have a Fourth Punic War. And to guarantee that, they made this, the fields sterile. That's what we were doing with these man-made fertilizers. We were sterilizing our soils so they couldn't grow. <clears throat> Petrochemicals are not renewable. We can't make more of them. We're trying to make more of them. We're making a great mess making more of them. Um, they're all from very highly toxic to non-target organisms. They can't tell which thing to kill and which thing not to kill. Anyone hear about the bee die-off in uh, the Northwest? Now there's been one in, I think, in Ontario. Millions of bees, because there were aphids in the European lindens in the parking lot at Target. Tragic. Why didn't you bring in a bunch of ladybugs? Uh, they didn't ask me. Um, including humans. They are toxic to us, too. Snow, don't use salt or urea. It goes right into your water sources. It's, everyone, yeah, I know you've gone on the freeway system. Have you checked out the overpasses lately on I-75? Okay, the breakdown of our infrastructure, especially our road infrastructure, a lot of it has to do with our use of salt. Why do we use salt? It's cheap. Well, it's cheap up front. It's not cheap in the long run. It's very expensive because we're not factoring in the cost of the infrastructure that's affected by it negatively, okay? The Great Lakes are the greatest inland lake system in the world, and we are completely altering the chemistry, and if we alter the chemistry of the lakes, we're altering the, the, what can live there. We're gonna have zebra mussels and snakehead if we keep going. Um, they also burn plant tissue, and they are also fatal to a number of highly desirable species, such as, for example, sugar maples. They don't like salt. I have a sugar maple across the street from me. I'm very glad Detroit doesn't salt their streets. I hope they never salt their streets. And the way things are looking, we probably won't be salting our streets for a long time. <laughs> so you know, there is a silver lining to every cloud. How about sand? Sand. I, in upstate New York, they live on a smaller inland lake system, which actually is even more remote from the, from the St. Lawrence Seaway than we are, the Finger Lakes. It's a tighter access to the St. Lawrence Seaway, Lake Hugo, I can't remember all the names. Um, they don't use salt, they use sand, because you don't need to melt the stuff, you just need to get across it safely. And they have hills. It works. If it works on hills, it'll work on here, okay? Um, it's inert, it doesn't break down, any, it's silica, that's all it is. It doesn't break down anything, it doesn't go into solution. It's effective regardless of the temperature. Salt water freezes at 29 degrees. Blazing sun on a winter day, if it's five degrees out, blazing sun, it's frozen. Doesn't matter. Sand, because it's silica, which of course is what glass is made of, each little grain of sand is a miniature lens. It can be five degrees out, and if it's sunny, it is melting that snow. All right, traction. Anyone ever gotten stuck in a snowbank? You throw some sand in under your tires? Yeah. Ooh, it works like a charm. Better than kitty litter, because kitty litter is clay. Clay does not work very well. Okay, axes of separating. This is something I discovered on my own. I'll shovel my snow, and I'll sprinkle my sharp sand, play sand, what have you, you know? Sprinkle it. Next time it snows, it lifts right off. It's good stuff. And you know, with the way our, our, our soil is here, a little bit of sand is not going to hurt it. I heard that. 
Um, it doesn't hurt any plants. It may actually improve your soil quality. And here's a really radical idea. I'm glad you're all sitting down. Kayla, slow down. Just slow down. Leave five minutes earlier. I know. I know. Yeah. OK. Plant water-wise, native species as garden ornamentals. As we talked about, they evolved to, com to, co to accommodate our conditions. I don't use any chemicals. I don't, you know, I can't. I need to go out there with a chair and a whip with some of the stuff I'm growing now. Back, down, the downy sunflower is going crazy. The retibita luciniata, going crazy. As I told you, the giant sunflower is six feet tall, OK? We're talking, I might have to go in there with a shark cage. <laughs> no worries. I don't need to weed in there. Nothing else could survive. They also, what's crit critical here is they evolved in concert with the native fauna. The relationship between the plants and the animals. And I don't just mean the insects. We are now discovering that the exotic species of plants that we grow can be used by our birds, but they are not the right nutritional makeup. And they are contributing to the decline of our native songbird populations. Everything is interconnected. If you pull one thing out, one example I'll give you. The first big arboricultural disaster in North America was the American chestnut, the chestnut blight. All right? We lost. 25% of the trees in the eastern half of the United States. That's how many of the trees were chestnut trees. We don't even know what animal species were dependent on that keystone tree. We know that almost 600 species of Lepidoptera alone, that's butterflies and moths, are dependent on our native oaks. What did we lose? We lost an entire chunk that we didn't even know what it was. It was gone. The relationships are critical. And yes, you can have butterflies if you have you know, exotic plants, because they can nectar on anything. But is the nectar really what they need? Is it of the right nutritional value? But they cannot raise their young on those native exotic plants. They have to have specific, and they're all native, for the most part, there are certain exceptions. Um, black swallowtail butterfly can host on parsley, dill, and fennel. Um, but, for example, monarchs have to host on native milkweeds. I don't, I, we need to stop mowing during monarch season on, on the highways and stuff. We need to maximize the opportunity. I've seen one monarch butterfly this year. One. They are in critical decline. And I'm going to tell you something. I, even, I have seen even an engineer who works for Ford just drop-jawed, awestruck, seeing a monarch butterfly come out of its chrysalis. This is what we're losing. Do not use inorganic chemical for fertilizers, often quick release, requiring repeated applications to retain effectiveness. I love those chemical fertilizers that you screw the thing on to your hose, right? And it says, apply every seven to 10 days. Now that's a great scam. If I use a slow release, uh, uh, you know, if, if I use the, I mean, I'm, I'm paying a lot of money for that. Every seven to 10 days they're telling me to use this. And let me tell you, there's a lot of salts to render those active chemicals available, soluble, as we said. They run after the storm drains. They're also very expensive. And, but don't forget, every seven to 10 days. Try using locally available natural fertilizers. There's so many sources of nutrients. And now, the, here's this, you know, cannot call compost a fertilizer. It's, no, can't call it a fertilizer. Compost is not a fertilizer. And I think the source of that, because we, I, when I did my master composting class, I was, that was told to us over and over again. It's laden with nutrients. It is not commercially made. So we can't call it a fertilizer. So you don't want fertilizers. Compost. 
Long-term benefits, fewer applications, everything is slow release, it breaks down over time, you don't have to do it every seven to 10 days. You can find resources, composted manures if you have chickens, if your friend has chickens, if your friend's friend has chickens, okay, lots of chickens. Kitchen waste and yard waste. I have one, I, I recycle and I compost. I have two plastic produce bags of kitty litter waste a, a week about, and I have one plastic grocery bag every two weeks of garbage. I don't put my garbage out. I take my garbage and put it in my neighbor's garbage because then the truck doesn't have to stop at my house for three bags of stuff. The only time I put my garbage out is when I clean out my studio. And then it's a good thing it's a big lift truck because it's the only thing that could pick that up. Um, you're building soil fertility and plant health, reducing trash going into landfills or in my case into the incinerator. There's no toxic chemical additives to escape into the environment and it's ch cheap. I get pine straw from my friend Trish for my acidic loving plants. I used to bring home the coffee grounds from work. They thought I was pretty crazy there. You know, it's everywhere and it's free. Start scoping out who has oak trees in your neighborhood. Check and make sure that they don't get their lawn treated and pick them up. I had a friend of mine ask me, she lives in um, oh, Highland Park, and she's like, you know, there's this house, they have a bunch of oak trees, and they put their leaves out. Do you think it would be okay for me to take them? I'm like, yes. Well, you know, wouldn't it be trespassing? No. I used to leaf rustle. There was one year I picked up, I, was a little, I get a, bit, a little obsessive. I rustled 70 bags of leaves. <laughs> yeah, I get, you know, a little competitive with myself, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's everything out there. Caribou, Starbucks, I'm not sure that they're doing that as much as they used to. If they're not, bother them about it. Build a relationship with the local Starbucks. Hey, if I bring a bucket in, will you put coffee grounds? I'll come and get it tomorrow. Build relationships, build community. Mix wood ash from your fireplace or fire pit and with your compost as well. Do not use your stuff from your grill that you've used that, uh, you know, no, not that stuff, that's bad. Pine straw, discarded Christmas trees or stands of pines, great stuff for acid loving plants. Rustle your neighbor's Christmas trees. I have a little mini forest in my backyard if we have enough snow and then when it starts to get warm, I cut them down and stick them back in my big compost pile. The trees, the birds love roosting in those trees. Um, you can also cut the branches down to, you know, to shelter your tender plants. Don't use pesticides. They become ineffective. They're toxic as all get out. If applied incorrectly, you may have no effect on what you're trying to target and may, may further compromise the environment. Fungicides are amongst the most toxic chemicals you can use in your garden. Plus, if they're not applied at the right time during the fungal bloom of the specific organism you're trying to get, you've completely blown it. If you, you do need to use a fungicide, especially in an or, arboricultural context, make sure that you have a certified arborist involved in doing that for you because they know the right dosage, they know the right timing and everything. Don't mess around. That stuff is really dangerous. Solarizing or, or smothering techniques. This is when I talked about the cardboard. Deprive undesirable plants of sunlight. Light is the one thing they have to have no matter what. If they don't get any water, they go to sleep. If they don't have any light, they die. That's the critical relationship there. You can enhance uh, soil quality in this process, actually. And there's no risk of misuse or overuse of toxic chemicals. When I started killing the grass in my front and backyards, I was digging it and turning it. True Green Chem Lawn, now known as True Green Lawn Care, called me up and had a great offer for lawn treatment. I said, well, you know, I'm killing my lawn. My friend Sue's husband, Lance, came over. They came over, the two of them came over, and he was a little bit of a lawn Nazi, really nice man. And he's like, you know, if you cut it this short, it'll die. I said, do you promise? <laughs> really? And he got this really scared, and the, you know, deer in the headlights looked like, oh my God, she's gone over the edge. So I, tr I told True Green Chem Lawn, I said, I'm killing my lawn. They're like, oh, we can help you with that too. <laughs> And 
And I said, I'm doing fine by myself, thank you. So for smothering or solarizing, cut down the existing plant matter. You don't have to haul it off, just cut it down. Because there's nutrients in there. I was explaining to the kids uh, that the point is not to carry it away, it's to leave it there, because all the nutrients are still in there, okay? With seven to 12 sheets of newsprint laid over, or corrugated cardboard if you have it handy, make sure the edges are overlapping. Top it off with topsoil compost or organic mulch. It's really a great technique to do it in the fall. And then you can plant in the spring. With uh, solarizing, neighbor across the street solarizing right now, um, whole front yard. Cover the area with black plastic, that'll make it really hot. You, what you're doing is you're burning everything up. You're killing everything. All right? Early in the season to maximize sun exposure, she got a lot of good stuff going on in there last week. Yeah, it hammered it. It was probably about 150 degrees in there, I'm telling you. Then you can plant in the fall. Now, here, in this case, um, this, is, this is a heat, this is a hot process. You may kill a lot of stuff off that may be desirable, too. Um, so you may want to introduce some good organic compost into that system before you plant. IPM. Corn gluten. And you know what? If you have an ant problem, cornmeal. They take it back home. They all eat it. It expands in their guts, and they blow up. <laughs> Borax. Borax is a chemical. Cornmeal, totally neutral. And if you have any left, you can make muffins, you know. Um, <laughs> Corn gluten said a chemical pre-emergent herbicides. I always cringe when I'm at Costco and I see them, the, those poor, misinformed, uninformed people buying those huge things of preen. I, you know, I start having seizures, you know, because the stuff is deadly. I, it's not selective. It'll, it's going to suppress growth for everything. It doesn't go, oh, that's a nice native plant. I'll leave that alone. No. It's like, ugh, everyone down. All right? It's a growth suppressant. It's a chemical. Corn gluten will do it for you. Now, it may take a couple years to build it up in the system, but it's not going to hurt anything you don't want it to hurt. Use manual methods. These are my weed killers. These are my bug killers. I don't touch mushrooms. OK? And the thing about these is I have to be looking at it. And I might say, oh, you know, that's just a few of those. Or the aphids are there. The ladybugs will come. When I had my garden tour, I had a private group came in, the Indian Village Men's Garden Club which is actually unisex now. It's been integrated. Um, they were like, there's a bunch of box elder bugs all over your cup plant. I'm like, yeah. Someone will come and eat them or something. You know, I'm not going to. Bugs are food. Bugs are food. Um, so yeah, these and these. Carbon credits. Carbon sequestration. Woody plants sequester a lot more carbon. I actually saw an article in the American Nursery Magazine by someone trying to convince us that turf was actually a good means of carbon sequestration. Think about it for just a moment. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't take her even that long. We use petrochemicals to cut it. We use petrochemicals to grow it. Then we cut it. Then we grow it. Then we cut it. It's this tall, and we cut it off every week. How much carbon are we sequestering? We're throwing carbon at it and using carbon to mow it. OK. Woody plants sequester the greatest amount of carbon. If you want a carbon sink, plant a hickory. Now, you can't transplant hickories. So what you want to do is you want to get a, you want to get a hickory nut, shag bark, shell bark. Put it where you want the hickory and pray, OK? They are carbon sinks. Carbon, they, they, trees hold the carbon the longest. They are the largest mass, so they hold the most. Think about how much carbon is in General Sherman, that redwood. Lots of carbon in that tree, OK? So woody plants, bigger woody plants to smaller woody plants. And you get herbaceous plants, perennials more than annuals. That's the equation. It's pretty simple. Turf grass, it's totally 
not carbon neutral. Um, get your Prius and then you can have turf grass. Um, energy derived from petrochemicals is not renewable. We're going to talk about energy now. Like water, fixed amount of it. We are, we are actually doing a lot of stuff that's, you know, we're using a lot of other renew non-renewable resources to get to some of this stuff. We're using water to get to shale. Okay, you know, zero minus zero is still zero. Okay, can't make more. Focus on renewable sources of energy, especially solar, wind, and human. Eat a good diet. Go out and use your rake or your broom, and then you can have some tiramisu and do it again. Use a broom or rake. It's meditative. It's like knitting, but better because you're outside moving. Pruning saw instead of a chainsaw for small pruning jobs. There are limits to this, as I learned. Manual edgers instead of gastroelectric edger. You know, let's talk about an upper body workout. Let me tell you. Manual ledger, that will get it for you every time. Use a push lawnmower if you have a smaller lawn. I'm going to come up with a lawnmower, the perfect real lawnmower, and I'm going to call it the real, R-E-A-L, mower. I'll let you know when it comes out. <laughs> Trench the edges of your garden beds to eliminate the need for a weed whip. The two most annoying sounds in the urban landscape. <laughs> Okay, that's it. I don't need that for a soundtrack in my life. Call local retailers to find out who is carrying what you need before you get in your car to hunt for it. I'm going to drive around for hours to see if I can find this thing that I'm not sure I need. We've all done it. But call ahead. Local independently owned nurseries will have a wider selection. They will have a more knowledgeable staff. They'll be more willing to cater to your specific needs. And the selection they have will be more specifically attuned to your locale. Somewhere at the big, big office at the big box store said, we're going to buy a million darts gold nine barks, and we're going to send them everywhere, regardless as to whether they're really right for that place or not. And people are going to buy them because they don't know any better. Special orders, you're never going to get a special order at a big box store. Some of the resources, local motion, Six Rivers. There's a lot of resources that are out there. The internet is a great tool. Just don't believe everything you read. Think about it. And my favorite verb. If you see something that doesn't seem right, if you don't see something that you think would be useful, it's sort of like the young lady at dinner this evening wasn't happy with her meal because she didn't like the dressing that came with it. But they did have what she liked on the menu, so we asked for it, and it was all better, although it could have used a little more mustard, <laughs> to be perfect. But it was an improvement. If you don't say anything, nothing is going to change. If you don't say, why are you still using styrofoam cups? You know, those are really hard to recycle. How about if we all brought our own cups? What a great idea that would be. Or at least use recyclable plastic. Or why are you bringing in cypress mulch? You do realize that that has not been sustainably harvested, and that's why we had Katrina, Rita, and Wilma several years ago. Because the mangroves are being unsustainably harvested. Those are supposed to be the buffer zone to protect the Gulf Coast from hurricanes. Or how about that peat moss problem? Why are you still selling peat moss? That's not being sustainably harvested. We are a profligate. We're going to hit the wall someday unless we decide to do things differently. And it's not that difficult to do things differently. It's not any more work, and it may be less expensive. We are borrowing this world from our children. I am not the first person to say that, and I know I will not be the last. And whether you have kids or not, it doesn't matter. They are all our children. And if we can do things to live a better life for ourselves and leave a better place for them, what's not to like? Um, I just want to, uh, on, on behalf oh, of the go. Garden Club, 
Uh, the Rochester branch of the Women's National Farm and Garden, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Cheryl, who I think that was wonderful. I think we all enjoyed it. And I know we all learned a whole lot. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl is certainly available to do more programs in more locations, and she has a whole list of great programs that she does. They're all entertaining. She is so knowledgeable. I appreciate her coming all the way up from Detroit. And let's all go to her on August 17th. Yes. Let's all make a plan. It's a Saturday to go down to her garden and see her wonderful native plants. There's all kinds of wonderful goodies out there to eat. Please come and eat some of them because or we'll have to take them home and, you know, eat them all. So come out and, yes. Does, does, does she have a website? Yes. 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 Get them out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and just to remind you all, um, we are a garden club here, and we kind of raise our money, and part of the money we raised this year we're using to kind of help Cheryl out for do, with doing this program. So come and join us at our Greens Market, which this year will be December 6th and 7th, I think, the Friday and Saturday, which yep. is the week after. Um, Thanksgiving, not the week of Thanksgiving, but the week after. That's how we raise all the money to give away. So if you come into our greens market, you help support us, and you help support all the wonderful things we do, including the children's garden. So come out, please come to the greens market and help us, and please enjoy the greens market and our goodies. Then. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Quote here that I would like to read from a great philosopher I think we're all familiar with, and it's Dr. Seuss from the Lorax. And it is unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Yeah. <laughs>